You're listening to the Truth About Bible Study taught by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. This morning we are back in our Sunday School series called The Truth About, and we are continuing our discussion on the truth about morality. We've been speaking about this particular topic for a few weeks now. So we are spending a lot of time here, and I hope that we see that there's value in establishing a firmly biblical foundation for morality. I hope we see there's value in examining ourselves to see if we are really as biblical as we think we are. I think a lot of times what happens is we assume because we've been in church and we've been around Christians for our whole lives that we are just very, very biblically minded in our morality. And I think it's very essential for us to look at our lives and say, are there areas where I've allowed myself to be blinded or to be confused or to, to step aside from exactly what God would want? Because this class and this, this lesson is a chance for us to actually step back from our lives and say, okay, this is what I want my morality to be. This is my ideal. What I want to do is I want to build my morality on the Word of God. Okay, I think everybody here would be, yes, amen, that's what I want to do. But then we have to step back and say, so how does my life look currently? Are there, are there areas of my life that I've allowed to slip from that ideal? And assess those and then try and fix them. Um, I want to start our class this morning by looking at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. So let's pray and then we'll go to Matthew chapter 7. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I pray that our discussion is fruitful and beneficial. I pray that, uh, that you are glorified and that uh, as your children, we would see the necessity and the benefit of following your word and examining ourselves and trying to um, find areas, search for areas in our life, Lord, that may not be exactly what you want them to be this, in this area of morality. Help us to see the seriousness of sin, and uh, Lord, I pray that we would um, attempt to do our best to represent Christ well on this earth. We love you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 We'll read to verse 27. It's a very familiar passage, um, but I think it helps us to realize the importance of building our foundation upon the Word of God or upon the rock of Christ. Matthew 27, sorry, Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine, and does them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Do you get the picture here? Two groups of people, or say two individuals, and they're both hearing the same lesson. They're both hearing the same truths. And they both would say, yes, I got it. I understood what was being said. Okay, they hear, heard the sayings of Christ, and the, the hearing implies that they understood what was going on. And one of them did what was said, and one of them did not, Right? And the one that did what was said built their house upon a rock. Now, what's interesting when I think about this is if you were to go to a beach and build a house upon a beach, what it would be like? I mean, for a little while, it would just be beautiful. How incredible would it be to just live on a beach, build your house like right on the sand and just be able to walk out your front door onto a beach? Just beautiful. The problem doesn't come until the storms come. And we come into these areas of our lives that for a while it seems like we're okay and everything's fine. But then we get into the situation where there's a storm and there's difficulty. And it's at that place that we're going to find that if we haven't built our lives truly on the Word of God, then we're in a lot of trouble. Okay. Now, building on a rock, it's more difficult in some sense, because if you're building on a foundation that's already laid, then you have to make sure that the building conforms well to its foundation. Right? You can't just stick any building on, on any foundation. You have to make sure that the building above fits the foundation it's sitting on. Otherwise, you have huge problems. And so it can be more difficult to build upon the rock, but it's necessary. 
Because if you're not built upon the rock, the storm's going to come. You build upon sand, you can dig out wherever you want. You can make, you can make your, your building fit. Okay, but it's a, lot, it's a lot worse when the storms come. And so Christ is telling us, make sure we're building upon the Word of God, upon Him. And I, I want to make sure as Christians that we are really trying to do that. That we're not just saying that that's what we want to do. We're not just lifting that up as an ideal. We're not just saying that my moral philosophy is, I believe the Bible is true and I'm going to follow it. But we're actually examining our lives and trying to do that. So it's a huge problem if we talk about our philosophy of ethics without making practical application to our lives. The problem is, sin is destructive. Every sin that you justify in your own mind is still destructive, even if you think it's okay. Sin that is motivated by misguided love is still destructive. It's still detrimental. It's still going to lead to death, even if you believe your motivation is right. Sin that is caused by allegiances to the wrong moral code is still destructive. It still brings death. God hates sin because it is contrary to his character and because it leaves in its wake death, misery, and destruction. And we need to realize that. That as we attempt to do this, we are going to have our old sinful nature pulling us away from this perfect standard of God's law. And we need to constantly check ourselves to make sure we're we're coming back in line with God's law back in line with the truth that God has laid out for us in his word. If we're not doing that, we could, even without knowing it, be walking to a path that's going to lead to misery, death, and destruction. So take sin very seriously. God's people ought to. Okay? We can't just leave this stuff in the classroom. We can't just know this stuff in our head. We have to live out these truths. And if we're not, what's the point of it? What are we doing When we're hearing preaching all the time, we're hearing teaching all the time, we're reading God's word and we're not applying it. What's going on? It's such a waste. And so God's people must be doing these things. This class is a thinking exercise, right? I really do want people to come into classes and think. I want them to to try and reason these things out. We are attempting to present what a biblical philosophy on ethics looks like. But we must apply it, because if we do, it will change our relationships, it will change our church, it will change your testimony. Western Christianity is very concerned about orthodoxy. Okay, I think in our minds or in our churches, a lot of times, and certainly there are many exceptions to this, but a lot of good churches are very concerned about orthodoxy. That is right belief. That's a good thing. But sometimes I wonder if we are less concerned about orthopraxy, right conduct. Christians ought to be very concerned with what we believe, but do, do we examine our actions with the same intensity as we examine our beliefs? Are we going through the God's Word and not just saying, do I believe the right thing, but okay, how does this change how I live? Have I done this right in my life? Is there an area of my life that I ought to be changing because of this? We do both of those things. Um, Equally concerned about orthopraxy. In Matthew chapter 7, still in the same verses, um, before he gives that parable, he says, Beware of false prophets, in verse 15, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but they are inwardly ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. You see the connection between false teaching and their fruits, their actions? Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. If we are believers that are attempting to to learn and study and know the right thing and believe the right thing, we also ought to be believers who are attempting to know and study and live the right thing. Our conduct should be right. None of this is beneficial if you are learning without examining yourself. So that's going to be my push every single lesson we do is, is, listen, we can learn this stuff. Are we living it? We must be doing both. So we looked at the last few lessons, the moral climate of our day. We saw that the climate of the day is just a rejection of God, his moral law, that we have created our own subjective morals in our society, that they're not based on any transcendent lawgiver or any objective law code. They're just ours and what makes sense to us and what feels right during this time. And our goal is to recognize the worldview we've been given, so the worldview that's always foisted upon us, and to see how to combat that, to learn how to combat that. 
We saw that the moral certainty of God's word, that God has given us a perfect law, his perfect word that is free from error, that it is objective moral standard that transcends individuals, transcends cultures, that it's beyond us. So it is truth, whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, whether it makes sense or not, this is what's true. Okay, And so that's a moral certainty of God's word, which leads to the moral conviction of God's people. We must be people of the word. We must be people who know, learn, live the word. Not people who are sure of their own morality just because they're Christians. It's very careful. We need to hold these truths firmly, but hold them humbly so that we continually go back to God's Word and allow God's Word to change us. Then we began to see that, that within the moral conviction of God's people, there are some moral roadblocks. There are some things that get in the way of God's people living what's right. The first one was the lack of knowledge. We don't know the Word of God. The second one is the lack of self-control. Simply, we know what's right and we choose not to do it. So at any time we come to one of those two things, we don't know what's right or we refuse to do what's right, we come to a roadblock where we are no longer going to be moral. But I think what we don't realize is that there's a lot of things in our life that I've called moral inebriates, that they're not things that, that, that necessarily stop us from being moral, but there are things that, that swerve our path or cloud our focus or cloud what we, we view as right and wrong. So God's word is true and right, but all of a sudden these things come in our lives and it becomes more difficult for us to see that. It becomes more clouded in our minds, what's right and wrong. And oftentimes we come to these scenarios and good people attempting to live godly lives do the wrong thing because their their judgment is clouded by these moral inebriates. All right? So we looked at the last three weeks we got through, last two weeks we got through three things. Hopefully this week we'll get to through three more and a bonus. The first one is misapplied justice. We saw that sometimes our desire for justice and our desire for revenge, it sometimes clouds our judgment there. And I think this is very, it's especially true when we have family involved. That a lot of times when family is involved, our view of justice is skewed a little bit. And then we act upon this misguided justice rather than allowing God to, to be God. That he is the judge. He is the, he is the one who said, um, vengeance is mine. And so we must learn to trust him that, that someday he'll make all wrong things right. But that's his job and not ours. We said it, the second thing is misguided compassion. Sometimes our compassion and our desire to alleviate temporary pain causes us to actually do immoral things. Because we're, we're alleviating pain that's, that's there for a purpose, that God has placed there. Whether it's the consequences of, of someone's sin, whatever it is. We, we might not know what it is, but sometimes we act immorally because we're trying to be kind. We're trying to be nice, but we're just not following what's right. And so we've got to make sure that we're tempering truth with love, that those two things never are separated. Then we saw misaligned authorities, that there are times when we have one law code and another law code, and they seem to be in conflict, and we don't know which one to follow, or we choose to follow the wrong one. And you hear this sometimes with people who have very strong family codes, where this is their family code, this is what the Word of God says, but this is the way I've been raised, and so I'm just going to keep doing this thing. Well, it might have been the way you've been raised, but it's not right. The Bible says that this is, and so put his law code first. Or times when we, we wonder about, okay, this is what the government says, but this is what God's Word says, so who do we follow? Well, we have to be able to assess that because sometimes I think people actually use the fact that God's word says something as a reason to disobey the government when really God doesn't seem to be giving us that option in that scenario. And so we talked about paying taxes as one of those examples. Um, so we can go on and on uh, with, with different examples. We've been through those ones already, so let's not get bogged down again. We're not getting stuck this morning. We're going to move on. All right, number, m- number four, this is new mistaken priorities. So what is something that causes us as we attempt to live this life right to be swayed in one direction or another? And I think sometimes our priorities are mistaken. They're off. Um, What do you do when the Ark of the Covenant is falling over? (laughs) What did you say, Mr. Renning? I said the same thing Uzzah did. The same thing Uzzah did. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, and 1 Chronicles chapter 13, 9 to 12, tells this tragic story of Uzzah. 
And it's when they were moving the Ark of the Covenant and God's people were moving it in a way that God had commanded them not to. They weren't following his guidelines. So they were doing it wrong. And Uzzah saw that the Ark was going to fall over, and so he put his hand out to steady it. And as he did that, God struck him dead. And it's a, it's a tragic story. And we look at that story and we say, oh, God, that seems so cruel. It seems so mean. He was just trying to correct this problem. He's just trying to steady the ark. He didn't want to fall over. Here's the, here's the problem. God's priority here was that his people obey him. His priority here is that they obey him from the beginning. And, and if they don't obey him, then there are consequences to that, that disobedience. Okay, Uzzah was not allowed to put out his hand to steady the ark because that wasn't part of the system that, that God had commanded. And so if Israel had obeyed him from the beginning, Uzzah hadn't died. So if you want to know why Uzzah died, it wasn't just his sin, it was the sin of David and the sin of Israel, right? It was the fact that they weren't following God. And so what God wanted here wasn't necessarily for the ark to be transported without falling. God wanted his people to obey. Uzzah's priority was that the ark didn't fall. His priority and the priority of Israel was not obedience to God. Okay, now that seems like a, a tragic story and we look at it and we wonder, God, that doesn't seem to make sense to us. But what we need to realize, what we need to learn to do is that um, God's priority must become greater than our own reason, our, our own thinking, our, our own understanding. Okay? I think that's what God means when he says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Sometimes we need to say, God, I don't get it, but I'm going to give this thought to you. I'm going to give this way to you. I'm going to follow your way and not my way. Mistaken priorities can cause us to act immorally when we begin to make outcome-based decisions on morality rather than seeking to obey God without considering the consequences. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel said, and Samuel speaking to Saul, who has just disobeyed God, but he disobeyed God with the best reason possible. Right? He disobeyed God with the reason that he would use the stuff that he didn't kill to sacrifice to God. So he'd give it to God rather than actually obeying him. And his, Samuel's response is, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So if you find yourself in a situation where you say, I know that this is what God says, but I could do so much good if I just did this. That I could do so much for the cause of Christ if I just didn't do this. I know God's word says to do it, but this situation is different. This situation is a time when I could go into this land and I could take all of this stuff and I could give it to God in this wonderful sacrifice where he would be so pleased with me. And God would say every single time, obey me. Just obey me. Do what I, like, when, when we do that, then we say, God, I just know better than you. In this situation, your word doesn't apply because this situation you didn't, you didn't think about when you were writing it, right? You would have had an exception clause if you had known. No, we must not do that. Obedience is a matter of faith and not a matter of reason. So firstly, recognize that in our lives, we obey because we believe God. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that comes to God must believe that He is, so God exists, that He is God Almighty in heaven, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And behind that second part of God being a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him is this whole idea of that God is a just God, a good God, who knows best. And so faith is believing in God and believing that he is almighty, good, a rewarder of those who will do what's right. And so then we just go out and live by faith, live in obedience and not live simply by reason. Now, what we'll find as we begin the process of obeying God, that it makes sense. Right? For the vast majority of times, what God asks you to do will make sense. And for the times that it doesn't make sense, maybe later on you'll say, oh, God, now I see why you had me do that instead of this. I see why I was supposed to respond this way, even though this way felt really right. And so we begin to change 
the way we act and see that God actually does know best. So, if we go back, I'm going to make some of you angry now. Uh, If we go back to our situation that we had given about the CTU agent, the counter-terrorist unit agent, that was in this moral predicament where he had a terrorist who had planted a bomb that was going to go off, and he knew it was going to go off, but he couldn't do anything to this man in order to force him to tell him. So he had to decide whether it was okay morally for him to hurt this man's family, to torture this man's family, his children, in order to get the information that he needed from this man to stop the bomb. Okay, This was, this was the scenario I gave you. Um, this was one that was presented to me in a, in a moral uh, philosophy class. And we, are, we come face to face with the scenario of, do we save life or do we obey God or are those two things in conflict? It, it is very difficult. And I would say that if you're going to work your way through that scenario, you, if you're going to come to the position where you say, that it is okay to torture the children because the outcome of that is what's best, you've got to, tr- you've got to find a biblical way of doing it. Right? So you've, you've got to make some type of, of choice that's biblically. Otherwise, it's, we have to recognize that it's not just okay to say, well, this is how I feel. Right? Now, I know this is a situation we're never going to be in, and that's why it's actually easier to talk about. Um, but we do get into situations like that where we have to make moral choices and what feels right isn't what God's word says is right. And we need to start learning to make the decision to do what God's word says. Okay? And now that might cause us to, to go really deep into God's word and to see if there's, there's a reason that what feels right actually is right. Okay? But don't just assume what feels right is always right because we are, our heart is deceitful. It is very deceitful. Okay? Our consciences have been affected by the world around us. And so we must be very careful. Um, yes, Steve. Uh, and Solomon was going to get the child and leave each half. He got the tooth right there from God. Yep. yep. I find that a good example. Yeah, absolutely. Solomon was very wise in, in the way he figured out what was true um, with those two, two women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually kill the kid. No, he didn't. he didn't. And it would have been a bad idea to kill the kid. <laughs> but the mothers thought that he was going to. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he That's knew that by doing that, up. the real mother would right. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. get the right scene. Dan. So there's actually a movie that played that whole um, theoretical thought out. Yeah. But yeah, it's called Unthinkable. And it's that the whole storyline is there. No way. Yeah. That's What happened at the end was basically... Um, that's sort of what they did. They deceived. Yes. Into thinking that his children were going to be hurt. Yeah. But they couldn't do it. That's that. I mean, that's good. And and, and I think that in our class, like, because part of this was we had to write a discussion board post on what we would do and what was right to do. And most people tried to go that route. And the problem is that wasn't actually an option as far as the way the question was worded. So the, the way the question was worded is you have to or you can't. You can't fake it. And so, um, but the, the, here's the thing about that thing. Now, in that, in that scenario, the way it's given to us is this is going to happen, okay? So there is a bomb planted and it's going to go off, right? And so in our scenario, we're trying to make the judgment. But in real life, we don't know. Like, we don't know if the bomb's going to malfunction. We don't know for sure if it's going to go off. We don't know whether if we are to fake it or not, right? So that's an instance where we say, okay, I think this makes sense, but I must obey because I don't know what God is doing somewhere else. Maybe somebody else is, is stumbling upon a bomb right now and is about to call the authorities and say, hey, listen, I found a bomb. Um, I'm, uh, I happen to be somebody who is trained to disarm bombs, and do you want me to disarm this one for you? <laughs> you, ne- you never know, right? <laughs> it's unlikely. No, I just think it would be harder to know that if it was like, you know that your, your family was in the building, that the bomb was going to go off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tara's making the point that I think was made by a few guys after the service that it, it becomes more complicated if you know that your own family is in the building that the bomb is planted, right? Uh, it does become more complicated. And that's, that's the whole point of this exercise is to see that when things become um, more complicated for us emotionally, it doesn't actually change right and wrong. 
And so it's during these times where we're faced with more emotion that we must train ourselves to do what's right. Okay? Because we can't allow emotions, our emotions to dictate what's true, what's right. So it is more difficult, but it's... Did God himself ever command his people to kill men, women, and children? Oh, God, yes, God did. He did say go into... And, and wipe them out. Yep. Had no regard for it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I know. And, and you're right. God did that. Now, so if God, if God came and he gave a command in this, in this scenario where um, these people are in, in the, the land that I've given you, okay, and they're morally evil and their, their um, time of mercy has ended. So there is a time that, that God's people want to kill people and God's like, no, their time, their time is not full yet. They're, they still have more time left. Um, but if, if they've come to the point in that society where they've been sinful for so long, they've rejected God for so long, that God says, go in and wipe them out, then absolutely. Um, that'd be God saying, this is what's right here. Right? And, and that's not the death of then innocent people, because God has declared them not innocent, guilty. Yep. The problem with accepting any of that kind of killing of uh, people... Mm-hmm. is then you can justify a killing abortionists and yep. going into their home and blowing it up. Or- yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it has to be a very direct command by God. So if, if God gave us in his word that said, if somebody is doing this, then you should kill him. Okay? Then that would be different. But God hasn't done that. Right? God has never done that with, like, he, his, his response for Christians is not, um, you respond in kind. Right? His response is, you turn the cheek, etc. So, that's and a very good point. Is God, right? Yeah, vengeance is God's. Yep. Pastor? I think, I think um, Deb brings a great point because it's also in the context of where we find those commands. We find those commands by God into a theocracy of Israel that he is in control yep. of. Yep. And, and so when you take that command and bring it into 21st century abortion mm-hmm. clinic, you have just taken the word God out of complete context. Yep. And you've used it for your own device. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and that's a really important point that Pastor brings up that we should recognize that when we're looking at um, some of the commands in the Old Testament about what the punishments for sin ought to be, that what he is doing is he's saying within the theocracy, within God's um, God ruling His people, these are the correct punishment for these crimes. These are the correct civil punishments. But he is not saying that as Christians we should be carrying out those punishments on people when we haven't been put in that, the, uh, that level of authority, when we don't run by that type of government. So it's not for God's people to take the judgments that God had p- given to Israel during their time of theocracy and then impose them ar- on our society. Yeah, that's, the, it's not God's plan at all. God's plan is for us to obey the government that is in our place. Right? Let's move on. Okay, so escaping the notion of outcome-based ethics is very difficult. As people, we always root for the vigilante hero, right? We always want to see justice done, even if it's done in the wrong way. Um, Robin Hood seems like a fantastic guy, doesn't he? Steals from the rich and gives to the poor. You've got to be careful. Um, most of the comic book heroes of our day that we cheer for, that we love, they're vigilantes. And I'm not saying, like, you need to not go to those movies. No. And I'm not saying you shouldn't even cheer for them. I'm just saying that in real life, in real society, we need to recognize that that's actually not God's way. God's way is through what he's given in his word. And we can't just justify doing wrong for the sake of an outcome that is right. That's number four. Number five is mistreatment in relationships mistreatment in relationships. So what happens is, in general, as people, we determine that we want to follow God's word and God's plan. But we have certain relationships in our lives where we don't even realize it, but we've allowed that to become very different than what God had planned for that kind of relationship. Okay, it happens most often in our closest relationships that we start to change what is right and wrong. So Mistreatment in relationships is past experiences in our relationships can cause us to act immorally when we stop judging our attitudes and our behaviors against an objective standard because we have formed sinful patterns and bad habits 
that are unwittingly contrary to God's word. So we form these bad habits, we form this this pattern of behavior toward that person because this is how we always act toward them because this is just what makes sense and this is maybe what works in our relationship or whatever, but we don't realize that these are actually sinful things. Negative attitudes and behaviors are caused by um, when we treat others in ways that we would know not to treat anyone else. And so maybe it's because, well, this is how we grew up in our house. This is how I've always treated my mother, right? This is how I've always treated my dad. Or this is how, this is how my parents treated me, and so this is how I, I ought to treat my own kids. Okay? We've, we've had those relationships. We, that just is within us to think this is what's right. This is how this relationship functions. And we don't realize that it's actually contrary to God's word. So, so those patterns of behavior need to be stopped. They need to be changed. Um, this is how it's always been with us, right? So picture a, a scenario maybe where an unsaved couple both comes to know Christ. But prior to their salvation, there was a lot of bad habits in their relationship. There was a lot of negative behavior. And it can be very easy for them to start cleaning up areas of their life on the outside, but to not realize the necessity of actually changing the dynamic of their own relationship. Okay, and it's not like that's not the only scenario. Oftentimes it happens with Christian couples in their relationship, where Christian couples have these negative actions and attitudes towards one another, but they've been there for so long that they just don't feel wrong anymore. That you've always treated your spouse this way, or this is how this is how you've learned to get them to act the way you want them to act, right? And so now you're behaving in a way that is sinful because you know it works with them. And it's so accepted within your relationship that you no longer think about it. It no longer occurs to you to to assess it, whether it's sinful or not. And this is a really negative thing. Maybe we think that our spouse or our partner or the person we're treating this way isn't bothered by it. It doesn't seem to bother them anymore. Yeah, maybe they've gotten used to it. Maybe they're used to being spoken to that way or, or treated that way. Maybe that you neglecting to listen to their opinion or caring about their needs is just normal for them and so they don't seem to be bothered by it anymore but that doesn't mean it's not sinful maybe it's because they're not doing their job so why should you right maybe that's why i mean you just kind of come to this place where this other person is not fulfilling their end of the deal and so i'm just not going to do mine but their actions toward you can't determine what's right for you what's right for how you're supposed to treat them that's what's amazing, I think, when, when God gives commands for owners and slaves, when he gives commands for um, husband and wife, when he gives commands for parents and child, that he doesn't qualify those commands with, you live this way if the other person is doing all the things that they're supposed to do. But if not, then, you know, just do whatever works. He's, giving, he's speaking directly to the husband, and he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then say, if she submits, he just says, this is how it's supposed to happen, right? He looks at the wives and he speaks directly to them. He looks at the, the sons and daughters and says, this is how you live. He looks at parents and he says, this is how you act. And so we, we don't let our past, our histories, uh, how the dynamic of our relationship currently works determine what's right and wrong, right? So could we have people that come to church and they want to be right in every area and they, this massive blind spot in their closest relationship isn't right, And that's a big problem. Maybe it's because they are doing your job, so why should you? Maybe that's why we think it's just okay. Well, I don't don't need to step up and leave my home. Why not? Because my wife is doing an awesome job of it already. Okay, but that's not God's God's plan. So she might be doing a good job, but we need to be biblical, right? We need to be right. So we don't just let past experiences, or we don't just let what makes sense to us or what seems to work for us determine what's right and wrong. Um, and can I tell you something before we just move on to that? I just said what works for us. Can, let's remember again that what seems to work for us for this short time can have huge problems down the road. So maybe this is a coping mechanism to get by for now, but it's not going to pay off. God actually does know best. So you might say, well, I don't need to change it because there's no problems. Not yet. But God does know best. We stop examining a pattern of behavior that has become normal to us. Normal tends to slip under the radar. 
right? If it's always this way, if it's normal, if it's normal with the people we see, if it's normal with other couples we know, if this is just normal in our family, then we don't assess it, we don't examine it. And that's a problem. We must do that. Sin can become natural and cease to feel like sin, but it doesn't cease being sin. <clears throat> and so we have these natural defense ne- mechanisms, fight or flight in relationships. Neither one of them s- seems sinful. They both can be. Mistreatment in relationships, number five. Number six, misled consciences. Misled consciences. We need to speed up because we are going to get done. We assume, <laughs> we assume that our inner compass is always pointing north. So we have these misled consciences where we, we assume that what we think is right is always right, but it needs tuning and it needs it often. We need to be constantly going back to the Word of God to determine what is right. Conscience is a gift for God, from God, and we ought not defile our conscience, meaning, meaning we shouldn't just go against them. We should guard our conscience. The New Testament has much to say about that, but we also need to be informing our conscience by the Word of God. And if that's not happening, we could be guarding and, and protecting something that is actually very misinformed, very misguided, misaligned. I love what Martin Luther said. I quoted it a couple Sundays ago during worship service. He said, My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. But the first part of his statement is essential. My conscience is captive to the word of God. Therefore, it's not right nor safe to go against your conscience. 1 Corinthians 8.12 says, But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. It's just talking about how the importance of our conscience, recognizing that. But we must be changing, allowing our, our conscience to be guided and reshaped and reformed as we, we read the Word. That's why going to the Word of God with humility is of the utmost importance. Misled conscience can act us can cause us to act immorally when we assume our morality is tantamount to God's morality, and we judge our own actions and the actions of others on that basis. So when we assume that what we think is the same as what God thinks in every area, then we can be misled by our conscience. Rather than pursuing truth in God's word, we allow our conscience to fester in ignorance. Okay? Don't let your conscience fester in ignorance because that festering of con- ignorant conscience is kind of gross. It leads to bad things. We create universal laws from our mistaken convictions, and so we start foisting our convictions that are based on these misunderstandings upon other people, and we change Christ, uh, our consciences that are misaligned and our, these convictions that we've based them on, and we change that into Christ's command. All of a sudden, this is Christ's universal command for all people. We've seen it happen in church many, many times. It's very important that we recognize the difference between conviction and command. And so we avoid clear Bible truths because they re- require changes in our lives. Ethical decisions are formed based on consciences that have been twisted, seared, and calloused. So the Bible says very clearly that you should not defile your conscience but that you must be informing your conscience by the Word of God. You must be allowing the Spirit to be leading your conscience. And that only happens when you're in God's Word, when you're, when you're in prayer, when you're seeking to obey Him. <clears throat> All right, and then the final thing I wanted to mention that I didn't have on here originally, but it's just a little bonus, is something that can often, and we should be aware of, that can often um, be a moral inebriate in our lives, is mistreated physical states. When we have something wrong in our physical health, it definitely impacts our spiritual and emotional health. Okay? It, it is going to impact that. It's going to impact some of the moral choices we want to make. If you've ever been really, really, really tired and then forced to deal with something difficult, you realize that, that your, your first reaction, it's, it's much harder for it to be a biblical one. Last night, I was very, very tired. I mean, crazy tired. And Tara, what did you say about the kids? Uh, I was like... I don't know. I, I, was being, I was being very quick with them. <laughs> um, and so, and I know, I'm, I know I was so tired, but that's not an excuse. Sometimes we use the way we feel as an excuse. Sometimes we use that, 
you know, we have this sickness, we have this illness, or we have, um, we're on this medication, or we're, we're this tired. And I know that that's true for a lot of people, that, that it's, it becomes a greater battle, but it never becomes a reason to stop fighting. It never, it never is an excuse to do wrong just because, right? It's difficult, but difficult doesn't mean God doesn't expect us, right? God expects many difficult things of his people. And so when you come to that state where you're super tired or when you have to take that medication for your health or when you, whatever it is, keep trying to do right. Battle through that, that drive or that push or whatever it is um, that makes you want to do the wrong thing, right? And I think as much as possible, we should be doing what we can to keep our physical and emotional health up because it does impact our spiritual health. They're, they're all connected. We're, we're people, right? We're body, soul, spirit. We've got all those parts. So in conclusion, Christians will be increasingly pressured to shift our morals to align with the culture and will be pressured by our circumstances to shift our morals when certain things come into our lives. Pressure from without, pressure from within the church, and pressure from within our own hearts can become very difficult for us. There will not be a shortage of challenges in your life. And so all of us being aware of those challenges and being ready to face them and attempting to do what God would have us to do, no matter what comes our way, is of the utmost importance. The cultural moral landscape is not getting better. Your heart is always going to attempt to deceive you, but we don't have to be confused. There are some things we can do in our life that will help us to overcome, and so just I'm going to list them very quickly, and then we'll be done. How do we overcome these things? How do we try and straighten out and see more clearly what's right and wrong in our life and, and, and give us a, a better chance of following that? Well, first of all, you probably guess you get into the Word of God. Humble submission to the Word of God. Confidence in God's unchanging, infallible, inerrant Word as our sole authority is absolutely essential. We must be in God's Word. We must be controlled by the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Within the context, um, Paul is speaking about all of these natural tendencies we have towards sin. And he says the answer, walk in the Spirit. Okay? Every day, seek, uh, seek the Spirit's help in your life. Okay? Try and obey him. Be sensitive to what he's saying. Be sensitive to the Bible verses that he's bringing to your mind as you live. Okay? It's a purposeful thing. This is not something that just is going to automatically happen to you just because you've been saved. This is something that you work hard at. Number three, thinking with an eternal perspective. Okay? Try and think about your circumstances, your situation from an eternal perspective. Number four, um, seek wise counsel. The Bible says a great deal about wise counsel. In Proverbs, it says, um, if there's no counsel, the people fall. In a multitude of counselors, there's safety. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in a multitude of counselors, they are established. Um, there's just so many verses about the, the importance of us going to wa- seek wise counsel. So if you're presented with a very difficult circumstance, find somebody in your life that you think loves God, knows God, and seek their advice. And, it, and maybe seek the advice of a few wise people. Okay? Try and get them to help you through what might emotionally be very difficult for you. Um, Number five, constant self-examination. How do we do this? Well, we constantly look at ourselves. God, what do I need to change? In this area, did I respond the right way? How could I respond better in the future? Um, We're not just examining our motives. We're examining our actions. We are very guilty of this, right? Often we think that because we meant well, then it was fine the way that we acted even though it was very inappropriate or or sinful um that it's just fine because we meant well no don't don't let yourself get there okay go try and try and learn to not just mean well but to actually do well do what's right examine yourself (laughs) and number six develop habits and patterns that allow the necessary time to process our actions and our attitudes so if, if this is something for you where you just seem to react poorly, develop a pattern or a habit, something in your life where you don't just react right away, where you give yourself the time to seek counsel or to pray about it or to think about it. Okay? All of those things are essential. Go to God's word. But it doesn't happen if all we're ever doing is responding immediately off the cuff. All, right? all of this ultimately is about the glory of God. All of this is so that we can live lives that, that bring him glory. And so... 
Let's do our best as God's people to live in light of God's truth for his glory. Thanks.